All right, well, good morning, everyone. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thanks for that kind introduction, Carl. Uh, it's always quite a privilege to travel south doing a, doing a grower meeting or a, or a meeting such as this uh, for Canadians. I normally get the opportunity to travel to tropical uh, locations such as Saskatoon or Grand Prairie or Rosetown <laughs> in December or January, and you're greeted with negative 30 or 40 temperatures when you exit the airplane. So it's always great to go further south. Uh, I've got a huge respect for, for the Canadians. I spend a lot of time in Canada every year. Uh, there's a lot of growers I work with in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. So I'd like to spend uh, upwards of 30 or 45 minutes with, here with you this morning, kind of explaining a little bit ab about my background, what I do, and what we do from a practical production perspective to help growers increase their, their yields and profits. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of expenses associated with raising wheat right now. Uh, there's a lot of upside from a point of view of, of profitability, if you can get the yields up, and the quality. So we'll be talking about a lot of these topics uh, as we get into the presentation. So as Kurt has already said, Carl, I'm sorry, has already said in the introduction, uh, I'm originally from the UK. Uh, I'm from Lincolnshire on the East Coast. Many of you have, have been to England and seen the kind of wheat yields that we produce. Uh, the UK average wheat yield is around 135 bushels per acre across all types and classes of wheat. Uh, but the higher end producers, the producers on the better ground, uh, despite 20 to 25 inches of annual rainfall, which is more than some of you get, I might suggest, especially in the last couple of years if you're in southern Saskatchewan or southern Alberta, obviously. But the guys that are in the 20 to 24 inch or 25 inch annual rainfall are achieving upwards of 200 bushel wheat. So a lot of my background comes from family farm. Uh, we farm in the US now on a small scale. Uh, I'm actually the fifth generation uh, farming now. And we really began, I say we, I was brought to the US in the late 80s by an ag retailer called Miles Farm Supply. And the boss of that company took an England trip, I believe in 1985, and he drove around the English countryside and recognized pretty quick that a lot of the English wheat producers were making 150 or better bushel per acre wheat yields. And he was back in, in Kentucky farming three or 4,000 acres of wheat, and his wheat average was 35 or 40 bushels per acre. And he stopped and talked to one farmer, and he asked the farmer what kind of wheat yields he was making, and the farmer said 140, 150, and he asked my former boss what he did, and he was embarrassed he was going to ask him what kind of wheat yields he had. He said, what do you do? He said, I drive a dust truck in Chicago. <laughs> but essentially what we did uh, to really get the ball rolling is we took a lot of farmers to England starting in the late 80s, early 90s, to basically show them what I call them the, the components of yield. What do you need to do to generate higher yields? For example, on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, we're showing growers over there residue management. You know, it's absolutely vital, and we'll get into this in more detail as we get into the presentation, but it's absolutely vital you spread the residue from the previous crop at harvest time. Most combines available in, in North America are really, really struggling with that. They're spreading residue 20 or 30 feet, and guys are putting 40, 45, or 50 foot heads on the front of the combines. So they've got parallel streaks across the field, and we'll explain more about that later on. What about fertilizer management? Uh, we show the producers when we go to England and other countries too, it's not just England. Uh, we show a lot of the producers, a lot of the management from a point of view of crop management. You know, Western Canadian producers historically have managed the crop in a low risk type scenario, putting 100% of the rain down at seeding time, expecting an average yield. And if it's a year in which you get better than average rainfall at critical times, there may be some opportunity for many of you to tap that potential or top that potential up with some additional post-applied nitrogen for yield and protein. So we show a lot of the growers a lot of the top dressing of nitrogen, either dry or liquid, depending on the region. And then, then there's obviously late season nitrogen. In the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see a small tractor-mounted spreader where they're going on putting some late season urea. It obviously takes a rain to move it into the profile, and some of you haven't had that in the last two years. But we're basically showing the growers and researchers 
uh, a lot of the elements of the whole production scheme to give them some perspectives and some ideas. And when we first came to Kentucky 34, 35 years ago, we were greeted with a lot of resistance because the state yield was 35. Everybody said it was too hot, it was too dry. You know, there was many different reasons. So we ended up recognizing the fact that we had to take a lot of different groups of people to England. For example, the group picture you see in front of you represents farmers, university researchers, there's media, there's dealers of equipment and seed and fertilizers and chemicals. We had to generate what we considered to be a unified effort to get everybody thinking on the same page, to get everybody to speak the same language to begin to move forward. So we also showed them a lot of the research that's associated with high management wheat. And the challenge that we've had, especially recently in the US, a lot of government agencies, the, the, the agricultural research, especially towards wheat, has been cut 10, 20, 30% per year for the past few years. So there's not a lot of money going into wheat research. And that was the challenge that we had 30 or 35 years ago. So we ended up having to do a lot of the research. So the company that brought me to the US 35 years ago approximately uh, was an ag retailer. They sold seed, fertilizer, and chemicals across many states, both at the re retail and wholesale level. They also sold equipment. So we brought the first stripper head. Some of you are familiar with the grain strippers, the Shelbourne Reynolds stripper headers. Uh, we actually brought the very first two stripper headers from England to the US, I think back in 1988. And they really took off in many, many areas as a tool to, to manage residue. They don't work obviously in all crops, but they're really good in cereals and flax, and they leave the residue standing as uniformly as you planted it. So as long as you do a good job seeding the crop uniformly, which is our goal, you know, the, the stripper heads leave the residue tall and standing, which is what we want to do. These are some of the agronomists and some of the researchers. And in the background, you'll see one of our research locations. There was 30 acres of replicated plots in that particular location. I think the most locations we had was seven that went to Oklahoma and as far north as North Dakota and Minnesota. So we had a number of these research farms. Again, all of these plots are individually harvested, individually planted, individually managed. And we had open days or field days, that's where this picture was, was taken, in which we bring farmers through the, the research location and show the growers all of the different management elements to be able to show them visibly what they do. And at the end of the year, there'd be a book compiled in which we'd present all the data and it would bring it down to, to dollars and cents, which ones were the most profitable at the grower level. So there's a lot of initiatives, again, from this organization. Again, they sold seed fertilizer and chemicals. So that was their core business, but we was the agronomy component within their agronomy, within the seed fertilizer and, and chemical sales business. Again, as I discussed in the 80s when I first came to this country, the average wheat yields for Kentucky, this is USDA data, the average yields were in that 30 to 40 bushel per acre range. If you see what they're doing today, last year it was in the high 80s, and that's average yields across the state of Kentucky. There's many growers that I work with that are far better than this as an average, but this is average state yields for Kentucky. Now this is winter wheat, okay? Mostly winter wheat. But again, look at the trend in yields going upwards over time. That's USDA data. The big thing that we've seen, which should be added to this particular chart, is the fact that a lot of the producers that adopted the high management technologies are still in business and they've expanded two, four, six times in the last 30 years. Many of the producers that didn't take on these higher management technologies have, uh, are, are no longer in business. So that's a component that needs to be considered or added to that chart, okay? So we've got producers, you know, that's, they're averaging over 100. Uh, this is a field of wheat in Kentucky, for example. Uh, the field of wheat averaged 122. It looks a lot like Europe from a point of view of uh, the number of heads and the density of the heads and the uniformity. All of those are key components within high management wheat. 
So the big question that a lot of people ask me is how high can wheat, wheat yields go? Uh, a few years ago, I had a chance to visit Mike Solari. At that time, he held the world record wheat yield uh, in 2010. Uh, on an average on one field, uh, he had an average yield verified by the Guinness Book of Records of 232 bushels per acre, and that was in uh, 2010. He was an Englishman by trade, uh, by, by origination, I guess, and he was a potato farmer. And it was a very refreshing conversation to have with a guy that's highly skilled in high management wheat because he talked the language that many European wheat producers talk about. He talked about seeding rates in plants per square meter. He talked about tillers per plant. He understood closely how many heads he was targeting at harvest time. He understood closely how many grains he was going to achieve per head, how many, what the uh, thousand kernel weight of the grains was, how he was able to, con to isolate and determine where his yields were. So a very sharp individual. He's since been beaten uh, by uh, uh, Eric Watson. Uh, he beat, he beat, uh, he, uh, exceeded Mike's uh, wheat yield record in November of 2020 with a 258.7 average wheat yield on a field. So there's a lot going on around the world when it comes to high management wheat. Uh, New Zealand, especially the South Island in New Zealand where this was obviously taken, and England are obviously uh, milder climates obviously than what you have. I mean both of those countries are surrounded by water and they're both what I consider to be the Goldilocks zone in which temperatures and rainfall are somewhat moderated or highly moderated so that's a big factor too. I often show growers this. Uh, I saw Gowan was one of your sponsors here at this event. I've done a lot of work with the Gowan company or the Dune company. It's the same uh, company with different names, different divisions out of Yuma, Arizona. And they called me about 10 or 15 years ago wanting me to help them with their wheat in their region. And my question to them before I visited them was what kind of wheat yields do you get now? And their response was, well, we get a lot of 135 to 150. Uh, but we figured we should be getting 200. And if you've ever been to Yuma, some of you have, or, or uh, the, uh, the uh, Yuma Valley, south of Yuma, uh, you know, that's a hot climate. It's, when I took this photo, uh, the average temperature that day, or the high temperature that day, was in the high 30 Celsius range, okay? And there's producers in that region able to raise 200 bushel per acre more wheat with irrigation and with multiple nitrogen applications. So they're making three to five nitrogen applications depending on health of the crop, tissue tests, plant color from a point of view of chlorophyll readings with a spad meter or a, or a green seeker type sensor. So they're, act, they're uh, proactively looking at the crop, monitoring the crop, deciding what it needs and making those applications based upon uh, research. But they're able to get 15, 16% protein at 200 bushel wheat. So it's not just yield, but it's protein quality that needs to be included in the conversation. So from a point of view of basics, I do a lot of these, I call them grower groups, and I'm not here to sell my services, I'm maxed out. Everybody I work with seems like they get bigger, so the workload gets bigger without taking on any additional growers. But I do a lot of grower groups such as this, and a grower group is basically defined as gathering five or ten like-minded growers in a region, and we meet a number of times a year, and we basically look at each other's fields in that region. One grower may be using this brand of cedar, one grower may be using a different brand of combine and chopper configuration. Another grower may be using a different sprayer or a different, uh, different principle of, of establishing a crop. And it gives us the opportunity to visit each of these growers and travel around as a group and see what's working and what's, what's not working. And I'm not here to sell different brands of cedar. You guys can, can figure out which works best in your area. I'm just giving you some suggestions based upon the growers that I work with, what we've found that works very well. But obviously what we're looking for is a uniform placement of seeds, high quality seeds, good germ, good vigor, so they all emerge ideally at the same time, uniformly in the row. Uniform spread of residue is obviously critical within that 
uh, quest for, for uniform uh, distribution of seeds and uniform emergence. So my grandfather, who farmed all of his life, uh, and his dad that died, at, died on his 80th birthday still farming, uh, they had a family saying, which was well sown is half grown. And that's wrong true, even through my, me and my son, because what we've seen over many years is if you can do a good job seeding your crop, getting those seeds in the ground to a uniform depth, covered with a uniform amount of soil, again spreading residue evenly, you're halfway towards maximum yields. The challenge that we have, and, and when we started doing these grower groups, you know, I'd be looking across the field and looking down carefully, and there'd be late emerging plants for whatever reason. You dig down and look at the roots, some of the roots were black or brown, and you can see there was some classic fertilizer injury from nitrogen, fertilizer burn. So you'd ask some of the growers, have, have you guys had any history of, of fertilizer injury? And, and there'd be no, and, and, you'd, and you'd start digging down and show them. So uh, what we're obviously looking for is, is placement of the seeds to a uniform depth, as, a, as I've mentioned working closely with producers on fertility, making sure we've got uh, sound fertility, especially FOS in, in ideally close proximity to the, to the seed in a side band or perhaps a mid-row band. And again, I'm not here to talk about different systems. You guys can figure that out. So then we're obviously taking what we call stand counts. Uh, I consider myself an expert in stand counts because I do thousands every year. And I can document over time which seeding systems provide the highest standards of uniformity quantified by counting the number of plants per yard of row, okay? Some seeders just do a better job getting uniform emergence in the row and uniform emergence out of the ground at the same time. Those are two different topics, but some seeders just do a better job. Uh, in this example, it's a disc seeder, and some of you guys are using disc seeder. Some of you uh, aren't for different reasons, and again, you can figure that out. But most of the producers I work with are using single disc drills just because it allows us to plant narrower rows which have significant yield benefits in higher yielding environments especially. Uh, better weed control too, but this is seven and a half inch rows. Uh, with a disc seeder in this example. But you can see on the, on the notebook to the right, not very clearly, but we've got relatively consistent numbers of plants per yard of row. You know, 60 per yard of row, 61, 60, 64, 62, 55. These are relatively tight groupings, and what we're looking for from a point of view of uniformity in the field, not only down the row, but across the seeder pass and across the field, because uh, high management wheat is all about uniformity and doing a good job with the seeder starting out. Like I said, well sown is half grown. So it's really important we get all the seeds in the ground to a uniform depth. Uh, I think over the past 20 or 30 years, we've obviously moved towards less and less tillage. Uh, some of the sideband openers still create a lot of tillage, especially on 10 inch spacing. You know, there's a little bit less obviously on 12, but there's less yield in the higher yielding environments on 12 compared to 10 or compared to seven and a half. When you get into some of the wheel tracks, differences in soil moistures, different soil types, you know, some of the different openers shine relative to others, and some do a better job with depth control than others. But if you look at the plant on the left-hand side, that was seeded about an inch deep, which is our target seeding depth, assuming you've got moisture. We've got a well-developed plant with a main stem and two tillers. Shortly down the row, there was a seed planted two inches deep in the middle with a main stem and two small tillers. And even in the same row, a little bit further down the row, in this particular example, there was a plant planted three inches deep, which only had a main stem. So there's a number of challenges associated with variable seeding depth. And we've done quite a bit of research on this, where we've intentionally planted replicated trials at different depths to try and establish the yield impact and the plant health impact of the different planting depths. 
And on the right hand side here on the screen you can see a plant planted one inches deep and you look at the standard of plant health and you look at the plant on the left hand side which was actually intentionally planted four inches deep and look at the standard of plant health. There's some significant differences and a lot of those translate into yields. So sometimes it's not just the yield differences, the devil is of, often in the detail from a point of view of stand reductions at deeper seeding depths. So there's a, there's a yield reduction as a result of a lower plant density when you seed it deeper, and there's obviously a, a lower number of tillers per plant when the plant is planted deeper. So if you can get a plant in the ground to a consistent depth, again ideally one inch, you've got the highest chance of getting a uniform emergence, uniform growth, and that plant structure that you're looking for for maximum yields. We try not to place 100% of the nitrogen uh, in the field at seeding time. You don't know what kind of yield you're going to get based on moisture, or at least I don't think you do. So we tend to use a really conservative rate of nitrogen, and then as moisture continues to fall, or hopefully it does through the season, then we're topping it up with post-applied nitrogen applications through the year for plant health, for yield, for, for protein, okay? So this is kind of what we're looking for. This is one of my growers in Saskatchewan, seven and a half inch rows, uh, disc seeded, zero till, pretty good standards of uniformity. And now we're going across the field at around first joint with a top dress application of liquid nitrogen based upon the health of the crop, the moisture, the yield potential, and where we think the protein needs to be relative to the yield potential. So that's the kind of standard of crop that we're looking for. The challenge that we often see is, and I mentioned it a little bit in the introduction when we talked about residue management, uh, some growers are buying, you know, six, eight hundred thousand dollar combines with heated seats, with, 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 with refrigerators, but they're not buying the higher end choppers and spreaders at the back to manage residue. Most of these choppers and spreaders are available across North America, but I actually talked to a, a John Deere dealer about a week ago, and as I was asking him about how many people were buying the advanced power cast option on the new John Deere combines, and he said farmers aren't asking for that. And I've also done work for John Deere. Uh, I spent some time at Silvis, Illinois. Their R&D facility for harvester works is in Silvis, Illinois. And there was a large glass room, uh, a lot of marketing and engineer guys represented. And I was showing them images such as this and some research to back up why we need to spread residue better. And one of the guys who was probably just playing devil's advocate, he said, you know, farmers don't care about residue management. And I suggested to him, I beg to differ, but a lot of guys that we work with have really concentrated on this. We need better choppers and spreaders at the back of the combine to help improve this topic. And they did release the advanced power cast. It's now available on their new machines, but again, not many guys are buying them. It's about a $10,000 option. But if you're looking at buying a new combine, you know, John Deere has better options. New Holland now has better options. Uh, Class has had better options for many years. They've had a pretty good understanding of residue management for many years. But I'm just suggesting that many growers across uh, the western provinces of Canada have residue management problems. Hopefully not this severe, but some of them are pretty detrimental to yields, okay? And it's not just wheat. Uh, some of the pulses you see high residue management or high residue spots within the field in which there's, there's poorer or reduced stands. So it's all about spreading residue at the combine. Uh, Case IH now has better re residue management options at the back. Uh, you need to be considering these if you're buying or, or looking at a, even a used machine. Look at the standards of chopper or residue management systems on the back. We try not to harrow fields. Uh, I've never been able to document a yield benefit to a harrow despite trying, okay? In many situations, the harrows hurt more than they help. So nobody that I work with actually harrows fields anymore. Spend the money on the better residue management systems on the combine would be suggestion number one. And if you can't get through the residue, maybe that's a seeding issue rather than a reason to harrow, okay? 
And I see a lot of guys in, and, and again, I'm not picking on different brands, but a lot of guys are struggling to get through residue despite harrowing. So a lot of, a lot of times the harrows aren't fixing the problem. The problem is obviously residue management at harvest time and seeding equipment with sufficient clearance to get through the higher residue loads from higher yield in previous crops. So again, I'm not, not a fan of harrows. I've had, like, challenged a lot of guys by having them harrow a half of a field on a diagonal perhaps and try and show me some yield maps to actually show that the harrows was, was making a, a visual difference on a yield monitor and, and nobody's been able to document it. So again, I'm not a fan of harrows. Spend your money on something that makes you money is my suggestion. Again, I'm not here to suggest different seeding systems. I'm just here to suggest take some stand counts, quantify the standards of emergence per meter of row or per yard of row within your fields, down the row, across the width of the cedar, including the wheel tracks in the center and the wings. Count them carefully also, because often, oftentimes there's differences across the cedar uh, as a result of metering systems on the drill. So that's obviously the starting point. Then we're obviously looking for that uniform emergence, which is a big challenge on some of the sideband drills in drier conditions, especially if there's any kind of wheel tracks, which is um, what I'm showing here. It tends to throw out chunks of material, and you don't get, you don't get that clean fertilizer placement between the seed and the, and the fertilizer band, and it quickly translates into fertilizer injury or root pruning of, the, of some of the wheat roots. So, Get some stand counts is my suggestion and quantify how well your system's doing. If you've got a farmer or a neighbor that's a, that's a good friend, get some counts in his fields and compare them to yours, ideally in similar soil types, close proximity situations, because oftentimes there's some improvements that can be made just by switching even openers on a drill. It may not even need a, a different brand machine. It may just need to be some better openers that work better in that set of conditions. We spend a lot of time with that, a lot. Nitrogen management, uh, I'm going to encourage all of you, if you get a set of conditions, you know, it's dry, it's dry, it's dry, it's dry, all of a sudden you start getting some rainfall, which is obviously increasing your yield potential for, for yield and protein, uh, obviously too, uh, there's going to be some opportunities to bang on some additional land. Whether it's dry or liquid, it's up to you. We prefer the liquid just because most guys have got a sprayer. They're already making a pair of tracks through the field for herbicides and fungicides so they can dribble on some additional nitrogen. The weakness is obviously it takes an, uh, a rainfall event to mobilize that post applied N into the soil profile. So you've got to have a rain after it, ideally a half inch. If there's a little bit of soil moisture, you might get by with less than that, but it takes a rain to move it into the soil. So keep that in mind. If you can apply some of these post-applied nitrogen, ideally at first or second joint, it hugely increases the size of flag leaves relative to a full rate of nitrogen applied at seeding time. We always see that. We've seen that many, many times over many locations. And obviously that large flag leaf is kind of that, that energy sink to generate the higher yields. That's my son in the field, he's actually kneeling down, he's not standing up, the wheat variety wasn't that tall. But that was near Purdue, Saskatchewan, a massive flag leaf. I think we put down 50 pounds of actual land at seeding time, and then came back with another 60 or 70 pounds of actual land at first, first joint stage. Then was going back in at flowering, which is where, why we were in this field at this time, uh, with a Prosaro application for fusarium suppression. Uh, but if you can bang some of these uh, second nitrogen applications on a field that's got better yield potential, you know, you can get significant yield and protein benefits, okay? So keep these things in mind. So for more information on, on, on European wheat management, there's a video on YouTube. It's, it's a real simple, down and dirty. It's just my son holding a camera. It's even windy. You can't hear me very well. But if you've got a YouTube, it's Needham High Wheat Yield. Uh, it's about a 10-minute video, but it explains a lot of the principles that one of the growers I work with in England is doing to generate 200 bushel wheat. Okay? It talks about micronutrients and tissue tests, head counts, 
it's on narrow rows. I think this field was on five inch rows, or it may have been four. You get over in Western Europe, there's a lot of five inch rows or narrower. Uh, as mentioned in the introduction, I've written a lot of books. Uh, my wife pretty much pushes a sandwich under the office door about twice a day and I just sit there and you've got to turn the phone off. You've just got to be 100% committed to, to write a book, but uh, there's a lot of good information in this. So what I'd like to do is, is turn it back to you guys. I've I hopefully got a few minutes here at the end in which I can answer some questions and maybe create some discussion. Um, one of the things I struggle with on, uh, on larger acres is the split application and the timeliness. You know, obviously you've seen some fairly striking results to recommend it, but I find that sweet spot between enough moisture to take the fertilizer where it needs to go versus too much and then the timeliness on large acres uh, to be able to do that in a pinch, you know, it, it, it uh, sort of, seems to have forced our hand towards putting it all down at time of seeding just to make sure that it's there in case it needs it. Sure. Um, obviously every year and, and situations a little differently, but what type of, uh, of a yield response, you know, given, given fav generally favorable conditions and good moisture, would you see, you know, applying 120 pounds of actual and, you know, in our case, 100 to 120, over a, over a four week period, you know, with, with some at seeding, some after, versus it all going down at, at time of seeding? So I'd say that, let me, let me answer that question with an example from Aberdeen, South Dakota, which is spring wheat country back in 2002. I can't remember names very well, but I can remember numbers. That's just the way I'm assembled, I guess. But in Aberdeen, South Dakota in 2002, they had 2.2 inches of rainfall between seeding and harvest, okay? And we worked with a lot of spring wheat producers back in the early 2000s in that area. And in 2002, the standard practice on the growers that we didn't work with was to put down 80 or 100 pounds of actual land at seeding time, and that was the standard practice, okay? Side band openers for the most part, a few mid-row mid bands, but mostly side band. The producers that we work with, we were recommending plus or minus 50 pound of actual nitrogen applied at seeding time, then we were gonna come back and top dress the rest, okay? And you gotta look at the previous crops. Most of the previous crops in that area were soybeans, not wheat after wheat. So just keep that in mind, okay? There's some residual nitrogen differences or uh, carbon differences you need to consider with residue. But in that particular year, we learned a lot because anybody that put 80 to 100, 100 pound of actual end down at seeding time, they had an inch or two of rainfall early in the season, so the crops was able to access that high amount of nitrogen. A lot of those crops had three, five, seven tillers per plant, looked great early on, but then it never rained later on and a lot of the canopies just burnt up because there was too many tillers created by the high amount of nitrogen applied early. And most of those fields made zero. They were zeroed out, zero. The growers that we work with, that we put 40 or 50 pound of N on at seeding time, a modest amount of nitrogen didn't create that mass of tillers early. We saw it was dry. We didn't apply any more nitrogen, so we saved the growers 50 pound of actual N, and we had 30 bushel wheat on a lot of fields because we didn't create that mass of tillers early in a dry year. Had it have rained at five, six leaf, first joint, somewhere in there, which is about the point at which we apply the second nitrogen, we would have been all over it. We would have put another whatever on it according to the rainfall and the soil moisture and the yield potential. But that year taught us a lot about nitrogen timing. And all I can say is you need a big sprayer. That's the first thing I tell the growers we work with. We need to be able to cover, I used to say all of your acres in a week with fusarium looming many years, at least when you get moisture, that's assumed. Uh, we don't have the luxury of being able to cover the acres in seven days. So I've got growers that have five or 6,000 acres of spring wheat and they've got two sprayers. Obviously they're spraying other crops, but they've got two 120 foot sprayers, but they're also using them as a nitrogen applicator, dribbling liquid nitrogen down into the canopy. So that's an extreme example from South Dakota, but that's a real example 
which we saved the grower plus or minus 50 pound of nitrogen, and a lot of them guys had 30 bush a week, compared to guys that put it all down at seeding time, generated a lot of tillers, looked great early on, and then it didn't rain anymore and it burnt up. But again, that's an extreme example, but I have seen examples that drastic. So that's another reason that we encourage the post-applied nitrogen. You don't know, or I don't think you know, what kind of a moisture environment you're gonna have that season, so putting it all down at seeding time is pretty risky. So at least put some down, I agree, you gotta put some down at seeding time, but if you get rain, in season rainfalls to generate high yields and, and protein, then you can go back in there and bang some more on. That would be my suggestion, okay?